I'd like to invite you to look with me in Isaiah chapter 5 as we continue our study through this gospel book of the Old Testament. I find that Isaiah is quoted as much as any of the Old Testament scriptures, perhaps second only to the Psalms, when we come to the New Testament. It is full of the gospel and much in here pertaining to Christ and how God is pleased to save sinners through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm going to read for us from verse 11 down to verse 17 for my text in this message. And may the Lord grant us hearing ears. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. And the harp, and the vial, and the tabret, and the pipe, and wine are in their feasts. But they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. Therefore my people are gone into captivity, because they have no knowledge, and their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore hell hath enlarged herself, and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory, and their multitude, and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. And the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled. When it talks about the mean man, it's talking about the man without any means, little or no means, whether he's poor or whether he's mighty, he'll be brought down and humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment. And that's really the title of this message, the Lord of hosts exalted. The Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. There again, people like to just say the word sanctified means to be made holy. Well, now wait a minute. Here it says, God that is holy shall be sanctified. We're not making God holy, but it's setting apart his name who is holy. We've been set apart unto God. We've been sanctified by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't make us perfect, but we've been set apart unto that holiness by a just satisfaction, as it says here, by righteousness or in righteousness. In verse 17, then shall the lambs feed after their manner and the waste places of the fat ones shall strangers eat. Now I realize that some of this language might seem a little bit strange to our ears, but I hope that by the time we're done, uh, the Lord gives us some understanding of what it is for him to be exalted as the Lord of hosts. You notice in this chapter, we find six different woes pronounced by our sovereign God. These are not easy portions of scripture to have to preach, but nonetheless, it is the Bible. And as we uh, open it, we find that there are warnings given to the wicked. There are warnings given to nations, to sinners, as individuals. And we see the first woe in verse 8. When you think about who these woes belong to, it's to the people of Israel, a religious society. The same sort of woe might be said of this our society that men consider to be Christian. Woe. You see, woe. In verse 8, woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field. It's not denouncing here the building of houses. <laughs> Abraham was a rich man. The Lord pros prospered him. Job was. If that is a gift that the Lord has given to you, an ability, and you can use it to his glory, there's nothing evil in the gain of possessions. But the problem is 
what you do with it. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. It's not money. Money is, is not moral or immoral. It's a, it's a note. It's a piece of paper. But I'll tell you, it sure turns a lot of people's heads. And, and all it is is a piece of paper, but put $10,000 $1 bills together and put it in front of somebody on a table and watch their demeanor. There's just something about the covetousness that's in the heart that causes a person to behave differently. Their eyes get water when they see it. Why? It's just money, but it's what's in the heart, you see. And that's really what's being condemned all the way down through here. In verse 11, woe unto them that rise up early in the morning that they may follow strong drink. Uh, the, the key is there, follow strong drink. When you give your life to it, when it becomes your habit, and uh, you stop and think about why there is such a problem with alcoholism today in society. It's people trying to drown out what they can't deal with in their heart. I work with people like that. I went on a cruise with them. One guy walked off the boat after we were done, and it's supposed to be just a relaxing time, but he said, I spent more money on the booze than I did the cruise. And you see the condition that people get in just because they don't want to have to think about going back to work. They don't want to have to think about dealing with responsibilities. And more so, they don't have to think about what this heart is telling them, they, 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 the conscience. And uh, rather than seek God, they, they'd rather <laughs> drown it out. That's really what is, is being described here. In, early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, but continue until night, to wine inflame them. Or as it says in the original, pursue them. <laughs> it becomes an addiction. And that's what's being described. Verse 18. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin, as it were, with a cart rope. So in other words, the attraction of living for self. And, you know, that's all it takes to be a sinner. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. You don't have to be, you don't have to be a murderer. You don't have to be, you know, a chainsaw murderer or a thief. Just go your own way. Just go your own way. And woe is what it says there. Verse 20, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. It has to do with the very honor and glory of Christ. Christ is set forth in this word. People say, well, that's not my Christ. They're calling good evil. And they're calling evil good in that they build up their own righteousness. They call what they do is good and therefore are not submitted to the righteousness of Christ. They put darkness for light and light for darkness. They put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And we'll be dealing with that when we get to it. At verse 21, these woes just multiply. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight will not be taught of the Spirit. I was mentioning to a fellow preacher over the phone this weekend, my problem is not with people who do not see the truth of what the Lord has taught me as far as our justification at the cross. I don't take issue there. I know I was, I've had to be taught. And I'm thankful as the Lord teaches me. My problem is with those who won't see it. You will not come that you might have life. And you might have it abundantly. There's a willing rebellion against the truth that puts all the glory in Christ and his death and that obedience unto death, his suffering in his body and soul to satisfy a holy God. People want to put it everywhere else. And that becomes then an issue. Wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Verse 22, woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which, and here's again the reason. You know, this isn't condemning a glass of wine every once in a while, or, uh, I mean, that's not, the, the sin is not in the bottle, but it is in the heart. 
and here is the problem which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. In other words, it begins, people can be bought. And you know it as well as I do in the business world. If you want to seal a deal with somebody, start pouring the wine, start pouring the liquid, start pouring the, the drink. It changes a whole, a man's whole ability to discern. And the next thing you know, anything goes. Anything goes. That's what's being condemned. You see, woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. That's why those Old Testament priests were not to touch wine when it was their turn to go into the tabernacle because their whole mind had to be focused on every detail of that worship and they were not to be given to it and it was because of the need to, to be discerning so there you have the six woes as we're going down through this particular chapter but it all culminates you know it's easy to stand up here perhaps and to point out this person's sin and that one woe to him woe to him but thank god if by his spirit he has brought you to say with Isaiah, woe is me. Because that's the woe we find in chapter 6. Down there in verse 5. When he had seen the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled his temple. And you notice it was in the year that King Uzziah died. You can go back and read that story back in the Chronicles about how the King Uzziah died. He was lifted up in pride. The Lord had prospered him over 40 years. He built up Jerusalem, and his name was honored. There wasn't, there wasn't anything I can find in King Uzziah's life, like some of these other kings, that he was leading people away into idolatry or somehow causing them to sin against the Lord. Everything about his kingship during that time was, at least as far as man is concerned, flawless and yet one day his heart was lifted up and he thought i can go into the temple of the lord and i don't need a priest to do it i'll go in and offer the sacrifice myself and 70 priests circled him and begged him not to 70 priests put him aside gave him the order as king step aside and he went in and laid his hand on the altar and God struck him with leprosy. And that's what Isaiah is saying here in verse one. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. What did he see? Something of his holiness, something of his justice. The Lord of hosts exalted. For Isaiah, it was an exaltation in grace because what it did was bring him low at Christ's feet. You say, well, what did this have to do with Christ? If you go over to John chapter 12 and verse 41, our Lord made mention of this particular instance. And this is God's right to do. You know, you say, well, why don't, why don't people see what we see? Well, they're blind. That's a judgment. God has passed them by. So I don't want to stand up here and tell you, go out there saying, woe to you that are given to strong drink, or woe to you that are following your own way. Uh, religion likes to do that. If the Lord has taught you, woe is me, then what it's going to do is cause you to understand even better why people do what they do. And uh, pray God's mercy if they're one of the Lord's that he in his time will open their eyes and cause them to see it. But if, if we have seen anything of his glory, if we know anything of our own uh, sinfulness, it's because the Lord has opened our eyes. And we've been brought to say, woe is me. But look here in John 12 and verse 39. Therefore they could not believe. Because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes. 
and harden their heart. You just remember that. If men don't believe, they cannot believe. If God has passed them by, they'll do nothing but believe a lie and continue to follow that lie to their destruction. This, this isn't a matter of arm twisting or reasoning with people to try to get them to see. If you know of Christ, the only reason you do is because the Spirit of God has opened your eyes and taught you something of who you are as a sinner, caused you to cry out, woe is me, and pointed you to the sacrifice. Just like with Isaiah, the messenger took the, the hot coal off the, off the altar. That's a burnt sacrifice. It touched his lips, you see. But other than that, nothing but hardness, nothing but blindness, that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted, and I should heal them. Now look at here in verse 41. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory. Whose glory? Christ's glory. And spake of him. Who? Christ. You see. So in seeing uh, the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and seeing that sacrifice is the only remedy, his eyes were turned to Christ. That's my prayer. You know, I preach to you week in and week out, but you know there may be a blindness that the Lord has subjected you to. He doesn't have to save anybody. He is God. He is exalted whether in salvation or condemnation. And I bow to that. Whether it's our children, whether it's our loved ones, whether it's acquaintances at work, whether it's other religious uh, people that we, we know who are outwardly very moral. But that's not their salvation, morality. You see, it's got to be the work of Christ and the work of Christ alone. I know that for the natural mind, these woes, coming back here to Isaiah chapter 5, these woes to those who haven't been taught of the Spirit, they fall on deaf ears. I preach these because they're here in the Word and they need to be stated, but you know, I think there's some people that feel if they stand up and pound the pulpit a little harder, raise their voice, and preach hellfire and brimstone, that they're going to scare people into, into heaven. You don't, you don't scare people into heaven. These woes, just if the unless the Lord's taught you, as soon as you walk out that door, you'll have forgotten. You'll go and sit in the car and turn on the radio, and you'll be off in another world immediately. It 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 won't mean a thing. But to those that are taught of the Spirit of God, again, it's not to strike fear in the heart, but it does cause us to thank the Lord that it is just from such a condemnation that the the Lord Jesus Christ bought us. And the Spirit of God has drawn us out, separated us unto His Son. But I know for a lot of people, there's an initial shaking, you know, when they hear these things. And then it's like someone, you know, getting woken up out of a sleep and the house could be on fire. But, oh, let me go back to sleep. There they go. You see, that's unless the Lord is pleased to draw us in His grace, we would be just like any one of these, just like any one. But in all things, the Lord of hosts will be exalted. And that's, that's the key verse down there in verse 16. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment. Doesn't say hopes to be, but shall be. In everything God does, there's nothing that fails his purpose. And notice, in judgment, in judgment. Again, people don't mind hearing that God saves. They might not like to hear how he saves. Everybody likes to sing Jesus saves, but they don't like to hear how he saves. But I'll tell you something worse to natural men's minds is the, the, the idea that God actually judges sinners. I'll guarantee you, if you're still in your natural mind here today, this is the thing that you want to throw furthest from your mind, the fact that God actually judges sinners. I know it's hard to believe, we're some measure of health. We have our jobs. We're paying bills. But when you stop and think about a judgment that awaits everyone that has not been redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ, my friends, it is as real as you're breathing right now, just as real, just as true.
is those lungs pumping that air in through your body, your heart. The day is coming when it will no longer pump. And that mind you have right now to be able to do the kind of work you do will be gone. And then nothing but the judgment unless the Lord has bought you. That's an, a rock of offense to many people in religion. Nobody likes to talk about God's wrath. No one likes to talk about his judgment. But I find that there's as much word in this word of God about judgment and wrath and holiness as there is about heaven and salvation and blessing, you see. Over in Romans chapter 9, and I know you're familiar with these chapters and these things, but I never want to presume. I know how the Lord has taught me, even chapters that I thought I knew pretty well as I've gone back and just read them. There have been times when the Spirit of God has opened my own heart and mind fuller and caused me to see even more plainly this truth of His sovereignty and His glory. Here in Romans chapter 9, beginning with verse 13, notice, as it is written. Well, this is not something that someone came up with, but this is God's Word, as it is written. Jacob have I loved but Esau have I hated. There's the point of contention. And you'll find some translations where they'll try to diminish it. I was over at the YMCA the other day and they had a so-called living Bible sitting on the counter there. And I'd spent years since I had even opened one up, but I picked it up and started looking at uh, some of these chapters and verses that are so clear and pointed in our Bible and to see how they've been smoothed over because of men trying to take and paraphrase the scriptures and make it more palatable to men. That's really what it's about. And you'll find, I didn't look this particular verse up, but I have seen it in some other translations. Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I loved less. Is that what that word means? Hated, loved less? No, there's a distinction being made. There are those that God loves, and not because of anything in them, but because he purposed to love them. Any of us that are the Lord's, that's the only thing we can say, is that God purposed to love me and gave me to his son, that his son pay my sin debt. Otherwise, he has every right to hate me. I am hateful. And so is every sinner born as a son of Adam, hateful. Why? Because of our sin. God's holy. God's just. And so when it says, Esau, have I hated? You notice it begs the question. That's how I know this is as strong as what is written right here, because what's the next question? What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Isn't that the first thing that Men come up with in their mind, well, God's unrighteous then. If he loves some and hates others, he's unrighteous. Well, read on. God forbid. God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. That's his prerogative. And that's what it means for the Lord of hosts to be exalted. So then, verse 16. Oh, that the whole religious world would listen to this one verse. So then, it is not of him that willeth. All these preachers going around telling you if you just will. Let's see your hand. You know, how many are willing today? It is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth. You better get your life straight. Start running. No, not of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. You know, if I was in that state right there, I would want to cry out to God to show mercy. But you know what? That takes the Spirit of God as well, because I lived for years under the false notion that I was the Lord's, and I didn't know it. But I didn't even know how to cry for mercy because I had such a high opinion of myself. You see, when you cry for mercy, it's when the Lord strips you of everything within you. Cause you to cry out with Isaiah, woe is me. I'm undone. 
uh, that particular chapter, as you know, is very precious to me. Because that's the word that the Lord brought home to this poor sinner's heart. It caused me to cry out, seek his mercy, look to Christ alone. He didn't make it easy on me. I struggled for three and a half months trying to justify myself that maybe it was something else, but the word kept coming home lost, lost, lost. And when it did, guess what? This poor sinner started crying for mercy. If you've never been lost, you'll never cry for mercy. But if the Lord ever begins that work of grace in your heart, that's all you're ever going to cry for. Crumbs of mercy. I worry. I guess I shouldn't because it's still of him. It's not of him that willeth nor him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. But I worry about people that have a lot of the right knowledge and can spout it back, even true doctrine. And yet I never hear a cry for mercy. It's just not there. It's, it's a pride. And that's even what we've read here. Scripture says, woe, you know, woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. All right, we'll come back here to Isaiah 5. There's a lot here. If we don't get done, we'll come back to it. But God is called here in verse 16, the Lord of hosts. That means armies. Jehovah Sabaoth. You were playing that as the prelude. A mighty fortress is our God. But that's the word that we use. It, it's not the Lord of Sabbath, as if in rest, although he is. But there it's the Lord. Uh, Jehovah Sabaoth is his name. And it's a Hebrew word that speaks of the Lord as being almighty. I, I get people get caught here once in a while. I say, well, show me where the word sovereign is used in Scripture. Well, you can't say the Lord Sabaoth without speaking of him who is sovereign. You see, sovereign Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment is the word. Over in Psalm 9 and verse 6, look in Psalm 9 and verse 6. O thou enemy, destructions are come to a perpetual end. And thou hast destroyed cities. Their memorial is perished with them. See, this is what it's talking about. The Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment. Those that are enemies of God. I'd rather have the whole Chinese army to be my enemy and suffer death at the hands of, of a Chinese army than I would to be the enemy of God, not to be reconciled by the death of his son. I don't think that people in their spiritual ignorance and blindness can fathom what it is to have God as their enemy. These are things that I think uh, people take for granted, but that's the sense there. The Lord of hosts, it's his right to bring judgment. So how is the Lord exalted in judgment? Well, come back here, and let me just go down through here and give you some notes and thoughts that I've written down here. First of all, as I've already stated, the Lord is exalted in judgment in that he has the right to save or to condemn. I wonder right now if you can sit there and truly say that. If he should condemn me, he would be just in doing so. There's something about the natural flesh that raises its head to say, no, not me. And yet where the Spirit of God is at work, I believe that he brings us like with Isaiah, woe is me. If the Lord should mark iniquities, who should stand? He is right in his judgments. He's right in his condemnation. And that's evident from the charges that we see brought against the people here. I already mentioned the strong drink that is referred to there in verse 11. But verse 12, again, the feasting. 
No one wants to come into a house of worship and hear a message like this unless the Spirit draws them. I agree with you. I agree when people say, well, if you just put a little more honey with your message, you might catch a few more flies. The problem is I'm not trying to catch flies. This is not a house of feasting other than feasting on Christ the Lamb. There's plenty of religious centers around where they've got bands, they've got entertainment, and it's no wonder the cars are packed in there. Whatever you use to draw people in is what you have to keep using to keep them there. But you know what? I'm not after a crowd. I'm not after the masses. It's not for lack of ability to do that sort of thing. It's just I have no desire to because you can entertain people on the road to hell, make them feel better about themselves, but it doesn't change their end. I'll tell you what people need to hear of Christ and him crucified. That's what you need to hear. That's what I need to hear, you see. But there's a frivolity and lightness. It says the harp, the vial, the tabret, the pipe, and the wine are in their feast. And here's the whole reason. They regard not the work of the Lord. What is the work of the Lord? Well, it is how he is just to justify sinners. The work of the Lord is how he purposed from all eternity to take the sin of a particular people and put it to the account of his son and take that righteous obedience that he worked out and put it to their account, that he might be a just God and Savior. But there had to be satisfaction. That's the work of the Lord. There had to be a just satisfaction and nothing more or less was required than the death of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. But people don't want to regard that work. They want to hear about their work. They need they need rewards. They need uh, programs that will acknowledge them for their giving and their witnessing and all of these things. No, there's only one work which should be of interest to any of us right now, and that's the work of the Lord. And all of these other things to entertain people does nothing but distract them, causes them to think about anything but the work of the Lord. And it says, neither consider the operation of his hands. I've just got a very short time each week to bring this home to our hearts, but that's what this is all about, the operation of his hands, you see. And what's the problem? Again, verse 13, no knowledge. My people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. What are they captive to? Themselves. They've been made captive to their own will. People talk about free will. There is no free will. Our will acts according to our nature. You know, can a dog suddenly desire to fly? Have you ever seen that? Our dog sits out there and, you know, watches a squirrel jumping from tree to tree or watches the birds going over flying or bark at them. But as far as I know, that dog has never had a desire, you know, to fly. He'll jump pretty high, but he comes right back down and goes back to being a dog. I mean, that's just his nature. And that's the way it is with any of us, unless the Spirit of God is enlivened the heart and, and reveal Christ in here. There's no knowledge of the truth and no desire to know. No desire to know. Captive. Their glory, verse 14, and multitude, that's masses. So people like to be with crowds. Pomp and self-exaltation. And then as we read it there in verse 15, the mean man, the poor man, the low man shall be brought down. That's almost a contradiction in terms. He's already low, and now he's going to be brought down even further. Just because a man is poor, poorness is not spirituality. You know, there's as much covetousness in a poor man as there is in a rich man. There's as much pride and anger in a poor man as there is in a rich man. But... The Lord says both together he'll bring low. That's what it is for him to be exalted in judgment. Verse 14 says he is appointed their portion in hell. That word hell is the word sheol. It's a word that's used in the Hebrew, might be better translated death. I'm not trying to diminish the reality of hell, but in the Old Testament, the whole concept of heaven and hell 
as we know it today, was not yet fully revealed. For those that were there, you'll find that often the word that they use for hell, the, the word is actually in the original, a big open pit into which the dead go. That was the perception. They die, you bury them. So you could read here, therefore death hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he that rejoices shall descend into it. The whole idea of being a pit into which the dead descend. It's later as you read in the New Testament that the Lord even uses the word Gehenna. It's a different word translated hell in English in our English translation but it would be more in line with depicting the burning fire of hell and God's wrath than this one word here. The reason I, I say that if you look over in Psalm 49 for example and I don't want to dwell too long on this, but Psalm 49, the whole point is make merry, do what you want to, to kind of put out of your thought the idea of, of dying, but you're still going to die. The Lord is going to, there's none of us getting out of here alive. And so what is our purpose here on this earth? But in Psalm 49 and verse 14, you see where it says, like sheep, they are laid in the grave. If you were to see that in the original, it's the word sheol. Same word here. Uh, we know the Lord doesn't send his sheep to hell, but lays them in the grave. In other words, death shall feed on them, and the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning, and their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. I know some people make a big doctrine out of the fact that Christ went to hell because that's the, that's the word that's translated. But I'm gonna tell you this, there's nothing more appalling than to think that Christ actually went to hell when he died because he said from the cross it is finished. What God required was obedience unto death and to assume that from there he had to go and suffer again three days while he was in the grave in order to really fulfill all righteousness is contrary to what we read. And, that, and the problem is it comes from the translation of this word hell because in Psalm 16, for example, in verse 10, that's how the translators used it or described it. It says, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Well, it's the same word, sheol. What he's saying is, thou wilt not leave my soul in death. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. The whole idea is that the longer a body lays dead, the more it sees corruption. But there was no corruption to be found on Christ's body or in it. And so, for that reason, uh, I would say here that even though the scriptures say broad is the way that leads to destruction, certainly hell does exist, but there's another word for it here in this particular portion of scripture. It's being used to describe the end of all those, which is death. The wages of sin is death. And do what you want to to try to protect yourself from it, but it is our appointed end. I'll just wrap up with this and then we'll come back in verse 16 of Isaiah 5 because our time's gone. How is the Lord exalted? Well, he's exalted in his right to save or to condemn. He's exalted in his appointing of sinners, uh, their portion in death. And then uh, here thirdly, he, he is exalted in that righteousness by which he is sanctified. You see, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. I believe it is what distinguishes God from the God, little G-O-D, of men's imagination. We live in a day where God's love is preached at the expense of his justice. This word righteousness here is the word justice. God is, 
He's just in all he does. If he saves you, it will be in a just manner. It has to be. That's why Christ had to die. He could not save. He could not declare righteous. He could not justify a sinner until Christ had satisfied law and justice. He passed by. I had someone take exception with me on that and say, well, you're limiting God. <laughs> well, God can't lie. Am I limiting him for saying that? He cannot deny himself. Am I limiting God for saying that? How on earth can it be said I'm limiting God by saying he will not save a sinner, declare him saved, unless that righteousness has been worked out to his satisfaction and holiness. That's why Christ came. That's the whole reason for the necessity of Christ dying. He's just in his salvation, but he's just in his condemnation as well. Every mouth will be stopped and found guilty before the Lord. You say, well, how could God send people to hell? I'll tell you how. He loves his own righteousness. That's why. And anybody that does not have that righteousness, which is by and through and in the Lord Jesus Christ alone, will face the righteousness, the justice of God alone. And there is nothing then but condemnation. So these woes are important, but We'll pick up with this next time, verse 17, because there is a, a word of promise there. Then shall the lambs feed after their manner, and the waste places of the fat ones shall strangers eat. There's a word of hope there that we're going to look at the next time. Lord willing. All right.